final panel. Um, I'm opening with a talk on data valence, and then I'll be followed by Unal Tatar from the National Cyber Security Institute of Turkey and Dr. Madeleine Carr from Aberystwyth University. I need to begin my talk by apologising to Tim. Uh, we attended the same workshop last week in Glasgow, so he's already listened to this paper once. If it's any consolation, Tim, <laughs> if it's any consolation, last week I only had 15 minutes, today I've got 20, so today you're getting the full uncut version. <laughs> I'd like to begin with a story from 2012 from the New York Times about the American superstore Target. The story was based on an interview with one of Target's data analysts, and it was about a marketing campaign that targeted pregnant women. Explaining why Target chose to target pregnant women, the analyst was quoted as saying, we knew that if we could identify them in their second trimester, there's a good chance we could capture them for years. As soon as we get them buying diapers from us, they're going to start buying everything else too. Target assigns every shopper a unique guest ID number. All your purchases are linked to your guest ID. Also linked to it is demographic information, like your age, whether you're married and have children, where you live, your estimated salary, what credit cards you own, and so on. There's also the possibility of buying more data, such as job history, political leanings, and charitable giving. The data analyst interviewed by the New York Times was given the task of constructing a pregnancy prediction model. The premise underlying the model was that women's shopping habits change during pregnancy. They buy things like unscented lotions and vitamin supplements. So the model assigned all female customers a pregnancy prediction score, which was based on customers' purchases of 25 specific products. The model turned out to be fairly accurate, not only in telling whether or not a woman was pregnant, but also in identifying the precise stage of the pregnancy. Women who were identified as being pregnant were then sent coupons which were timed to the specific stage of their pregnancy. <coughs> the New York Times tells how one angry father one day walked into a Target store outside Minneapolis and demanded to see the manager. His daughter had received coupons in the post. He said to the manager, my daughter's still in high school and you're sending her coupons for baby clothes and cribs. Are you trying to encourage her to get pregnant? <laughs> the manager apologised. A few days later, the manager phoned the father to apologise again. This time the father was quite embarrassed. I had a talk with my daughter. It turns out there's been some activities in my house I haven't been completely aware of. <laughs> She's due in August and I owe you an apology. Well, marketers have been using information databases for targeted marketing campaigns like this one since the 1970s. But could data analytics be used in a similar way in the realm of counter-terrorism? If the same degree of predictive potential could be achieved in the realm of counter-terrorism, terrorist activity could be detected at an early stage and attacks prevented. Well, there have certainly been some quite bold claims about the predictive potential of data valence. Some IT specialists have claimed that data valence could have prevented the attacks of 9-11. Indeed, it was in the aftermath of 9-11 that the Pentagon launched the Total Information Awareness Programme. This programme proposed combining databases held by state and federal governments <coughs> with private data held by private data brokers to create a, quote, new kind of extremely large, omnimedia, virtually centralised and semantically rich information repository that is not constrained by today's limited commercial database products. The logo for the programme, as you can see on the screen, was the all-seeing eye of providence. Well, 
Well, the starting point for my paper today is a distinction between subject-based queries and pattern-based queries. Subject-based queries begin with known suspects and look for links to other suspects or suspicious activities. Pattern-based queries, by contrast, do not begin with individualized suspicion. The hypothesis is that in order to launch a terrorist attack, terrorists must complete some transactions which will manifest themselves in databases. In other words, the transactions will leave a signature. So you try and imagine, straight predict, what this signature will look like, what transactions will be necessary for the attack to occur. You use this signature to construct a model and then you use advanced search methods to identify individuals who fit the model. The biggest claimed benefit of pattern-based queries is that they will enable you to find clean skins, or unknown unknowns if you prefer Rumsfeldian. So just as Target was able to learn that the daughter was pregnant before her own father had any inkling, so intelligence officers will be able to identify potential attackers before they arouse any suspicion. Now, because pattern-based queries be, do not begin with individualized suspicion, they raise questions about privacy. And we'll come on to those shortly, but it's important, first of all, to look at the claimed security benefits. One of the principal difficulties with pattern-based queries in this context is modeling. You can identify crimes like credit card fraud by searching for outlier conduct in the midst of legitimate conduct. But terrorist preparations are unlikely to be outlier conduct. By contrast, they will be designed to appear legitimate. So you'll be searching for apparently legitimate conduct in the midst of legitimate conduct. Add to this the fact that in the commercial context, analysts have enormous data sets to work from. By contrast, successful terrorist attacks are relatively rare, and so the evidential basis for constructing models is small. Plus, working on the basis of past attacks is necessarily reactive, so you might miss innovative or novel forms of attack. The American Civil Liberties Union has argued that what you need is not more information, but better use of existing information. You don't find a needle in a haystack by adding more hay, is their argument. Well, the volume of data does become significant when you consider the issue of false positives. A false positive is an individual who is wrongly deemed to be worthy of suspicion. To complete the set of metaphors, proponents of pattern-based queries have described them as draining the swamp to catch the snake. But for such a method to be effective, an extremely high rate of accuracy is necessary. You have to drain the entire swamp. In a population of 250 million, even a 99.9% .9 level of accuracy would result in a quarter of a million false positives. And few seem to think that a 99.9% .9 level of accuracy is possible. You have the modeling difficulties I've already mentioned. You also have problems with the quality of data. Data could be incomplete or incorrect. And this is made worse by crimes like identity theft. As well as false positives, you also have the problem of false negatives individuals who are wrongly deemed not to be worthy of suspicion. And the fact, as we've heard in the last day or so, the fact that many terrorists use technologies like anonymization, like encryption, exacerbates the likely percentage of false negatives. And when you put these different problems together, 
The result is collateral security and opportunity costs. Resources and time could potentially be spent investigating false positives, potentially very large numbers of false positives, whilst false negatives might escape attention. Depending on the model used, the false positives returned could also include a disproportionate number of people from particular minority communities. And this has the potential to generate resentment and ill feeling, which could then undermine other preventative work, which emphasises the importance of community cohesion. So the security benefits have arguably been overstated. At the same time, there's a tendency to downplay the impact on individuals' privacy. The concern here is that pattern-based queries involve the state having access to individuals' data without any individualised suspicion. Well, some have responded to this by suggesting that privacy simply isn't implicated at all. Judge, Judge Richard Posner, for example, has argued that because the initial sifting is done by computers, privacy concerns simply don't arise. Others concede that privacy is implicated, but argue that privacy concerns have little weight in this context. Daniel Solov describes this as the nothing to hide perspective. The assumption here is that authorities will not be interested in the data of law abiding citizens, whilst terrorist suspects have no legitimate privacy interests in the first place. Solov argues, and I think this speaks to the discussions in the previous panel, Solov argues that the nothing to hide perspective misses the point. The nothing to hide perspective focuses on the collection of information and on the dissemination of information. But the key concerns, Solov argues, are in connection to the processing of information. And it's here that data valence raises three sets of concerns. First, there are concerns about aggregation the aggregation of data. Techniques like data mining make it possible to take lots of discrete pieces of data about an individual and reassemble them. Now, even if each individual piece of data is innocuous and not something the person would be concerned to hide, the reconstructed assemblage might be something the person would regard as private the whole might be greater than the sum of the parts. Moreover, this aggregation is often done without the individual's permission and sometimes even without the individual's knowledge. This raises issues of technological due process. And add to this the fact that in practice, it can be very difficult to correct errors in your virtual data double. The second set of concerns involves the relationship between the individual and the state. The example that I started with illustrated the power that data-driven marketing gives superstores like Target over its customers. Customers are sorted into categories and opportunities like money-saving coupons are allocated on the basis of this categorization. But when you apply that in the context of counter-terrorism, the power of sorting can become the power of discrimination. Sorting individuals on the basis of what is perceived to be suspicious and perceived to be illegitimate can result in the construction of suspect populations. And then thirdly, data valence raises concerns about normalisation. Neil Richards has argued that surveillance can deter people from engaging in thoughts and deeds that others might consider deviant. It therefore undermines society's commitment to intellectual diversity and individuality. 
and indeed there is some empirical evidence that the Snowden revelations had a chilling effect on people's use of Google search terms. Not just terms which are security sensitive, but terms which are personally embarrassing as well. So there are some sound reasons to protect individuals' privacy interests in this context. In Europe, data valence programmes, like the ones I've described, fall within Article 8 of the European Convention. This is the text of Article 8. It protects the right to respect for your private and family life. So where this right applies, the court must assess whether the infringement of the right can be justified. And the key point for present purposes is the part I've underlined. The court must assess whether the infringement is necessary in a democratic society in the interests of national security. Now this test of necessity is important because it gives the court the opportunity to consider two things. Firstly, it allows the opportunity to consider whether the proposed investigation will in fact result in security gains. Or are the claimed security benefits merely speculative? Or are they offset by collateral security costs? And secondly, it gives the court the opportunity to assess whether there are other investigative techniques which are available other techniques which may have a lesser impact on individuals' privacy. So if other techniques are available, it may not be possible to describe data valence as necessary. So that's the nature of the inquiry in Europe. In the US, things are quite different. The key provision in terms of the US is the US Fourth Amendment. This is the text of the Fourth Amendment. As you can see, it applies in relation to unreasonable searches. And the test that the courts use to decide whether or not that applies is based on an individual's reasonable expectation of privacy. Reasonable expectation of privacy. Now, the key point is that the US courts have held that individuals do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in two types of data. First, there is no reasonable expectation of privacy in matters which are publicly available, such as the location of your car on the public road. And then secondly, there's no reasonable expectation of privacy in relation to records that you've shared with a third party. So the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to financial records because you've shared those with your bank. It doesn't apply to communications data because you've shared those with your communications provider. So these pieces of data fall outside the scope of the Fourth Amendment. And yet it's pieces of data like that which are likely to be used in data valence programmes. So the key question then in terms of the Fourth Amendment and data valence is whether the process of aggregation can be regarded as constitutionally significant. The Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to these pieces of data individually, but could it apply to the assemblage, the reconstructed assemblage? And this is currently a moot point. There is a case decided by the US Supreme Court, US against Jones, and in that case, four of the nine justices took a quantitative approach in the case involving GPS surveillance. So these four said GPS surveillance falls outside the scope of the Fourth Amendment if it's for one day. But in Jones's case, it was done for 28 days. And they said that length of time meant that the Fourth Amendment did apply. So four of the nine took this quantitative approach. Will a similar quantitative approach be taken in cases involving mass data valence? The early signs are mixed. There's one case, Clayman, in which the judge said it was significantly likely that the Fourth Amendment would apply. 
but there's a contrasting case, Clapper, where the judge said the collection of breathtaking amounts of information unprotected by the Fourth Amendment does not transform that sweep into a Fourth Amendment search. He summed it up by saying 100 times zero is still zero. So it's a moot point. If aggregation were to be regarded as constitutionally significant, then the Fourth Amendment's reasonableness requirement could provide an opportunity for similar judicial scrutiny to that exercised in Europe. But if the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply, then there will be far less protection for individuals from data valence programmes. Citizens will instead have to rely on specific statutory schemes. Many of these impose looser constraints. So to conclude, the claimed security benefits of pattern-based queries are contestable, while there are important concerns about individuals' privacy. In Europe, Article 8 of the Convention provides a framework for courts to assess the necessity of these programmes, but in the US, by contrast, the constitutional protection of individuals' privacy is far more uncertain. Thank you for listening.